doing that from Albany all the way into Lyndon along the entire route. Uh, that's part of the permitting process that the state of New Jersey has, that the uh, state of New York has. Uh, we have no clean water exemption. I, and I don't understand some of the things that people say, but you know, there, that, there's no exemption for that. We comply with all the environmental statutes that are in place. We have no exemption. You're not going for any waivers of hardship under the regulations? Okay. You'll, you'll get an opportunity when you step up, okay? Well, thank you. Um, and I'm sorry, you're, you had a couple questions. And so. the operating temperature. Okay, this is not a gas pipeline, this is a liquid pipeline. It has an operating temperature. When, yeah. when, the, gas, when the oil is running through, it has an operating temperature. I used to work for an engineering company. I'm and here. I used to work for an engineering company, built oil refineries in Saudi Arabia. I know engineers know everything down to the most iota. So I'm asking you, what do you anticipate? Yeah, I, I'm not an engineer, but I can get, if you give me your email information, I, I certainly information. will. Yes, I will. I will find that out for you. Thank you. I'm sure someone on our team knows. I just don't. And can I give you this? Sure. Okay. Thank you. My name is Camille Gaines. 39 Wilshire Terrace, Kinelon. I, as a nine-year Kinelon resident and member of St. Mary's, I'm speaking on behalf of myself and Jackie Schramm, Director of the Social Justice Ministry at St. Mary's Parish in Pompton Lakes, which has many Kinelon residents as parishioners. St. Mary's is very proud to be a green community. St. Francis's principles of respect for the environment and the oneness of creation and humanity empowers us to speak on this issue. We believe we all have a responsibility and obligation to protect the environment. We need to focus on renewables rather than perpetuate the non-renewables that are destroying our environment. <laughs> we are risking our town's safety and health for the profits of a private company, Pilgrim Pipeline which relies and will make its vast profits on a limited resource. Meanwhile, the forests, the water supply, and the dense communities we live in are all being put at risk. For what purpose? Money. Tennessee Pipeline did not choose to come along Route 287 because of the risks of the vibrations of the trucks along that route. Why would we allow this pipeline of Bachran Crude oil, which is the most explosive, to come along that same route. We are, we are bearing all the risks, and we get nothing in return. <laughs> Who is to say that transporting via these pipelines is the more stable, is more stable than rail and barges? Additionally, who is to say that once they are transporting billions of gallons a year through these pipelines, they won't continue to use the barges? and rails. That's right. That's right. This, pro these pro this proposed pipeline seems to allow them to move more faster and make more profits at the risk to all the towns it passes through. Yeah. And who is looking out for us? Who holds Pilgrim accountable for anything that they said? Conclusion. Remember Kinlon always states it's a green community. The longer we say it's fixated on Pilgrim pipeline and limited fossil fuels, the further we get away from talking about renewable energy and doing something about it. When the pipes fail and or an explosion does happen, it may be too late. Let's do the right thing, like our neighboring towns, Oakland, Montville, and Parsippany, and even Watcham, and pass a resolution against Pilgrim. St. Mary's, as a Franciscan community, speaks on behalf of the voiceless which includes the earth, its air, and water, and protects people who do not have a voice to speak about this issue, and finally, for our future generations. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Norm Dotty. I've been a resident here for about 35 years. I've been a member of the fire department for 35 years. I'm on the planning board, although to make very clear, I'm not speaking for the planning board. I'm on the environmental commission, but I'm not speaking for the environmental commission. I would be willing to bet 
that I am the only one here who has A, worked on a pipeline operation, and B, worked on a barge operation on the Hudson River. Pipeline operation in decades never had a problem. I was on the tug pushing the barge on the Hudson when it ran aground. There is nothing that is 100% safe. But the fact of the matter is, the pipelines, and just to be clear too, I don't work for these people, I don't know these people, I have no stock in these people or anything. <laughs> pipelines are the safest form of bulk transportation around. I walked around this building before I came in here. I didn't see one bicycle outside. How did you people get here tonight? I came in a Prius. Maybe some of you walked, but there's a lot of cars out there. The fact of the matter is, if you, th as, if you think that rail transportation, running down Route 23 is safer, then come join the fire department. If you think transportation on the highway is safer, come join the fire department. I am staggered at the number of people who are here who are not residents. Fine. However they want to work it, that's fine. But the idea that this pipeline is some terrible thing, there's just no basis in fact. Maybe you don't want to believe in fact, but that's the truth. And, and I, I could say more, but I'm just so, I, I, I'm incredulous at this discussion. Thank you for your attention. Hello, my name is Caitlin Milsax and I am with the New Jersey Sierra Club. Um, so to the points that were just made, there are so many non-residents of Kenelon here tonight because this is the first time that Pilgrim has decided to grace the communities that its infrastructure is going to run through with its presence. Multiple communities have asked for, oh, Oakland, you went to Oakland, okay. This is your first real public presentation that people had noticed that you were coming and going to answer questions. And from what I heard, you weren't able to answer too many questions in Oakland. So this is why there are so many people that are not from Kinalan here, and thank you very much to the mayor for arranging this meeting so that the borough residents <laughs> and the wider community could learn more. So thank you for hosting us tonight. Um, and you know what, the previous person was absolutely correct. We all drove here in a car tonight. But that is why we're here, because this is a critical time for us to decide how our energy, uh, where our energy is going to come from in the future. They're talking about a multi-billion dollar project to bring more fossil fuels, more climate change pollution causing materials into our state, when we could be spending the same amount on investing in renewable energy technology. So, Right, we do need a major paradigm shift, and this is a good place to start by saying no to oil pipeline. But I do have some questions for you since you are finally out answering questions. Uh, well, to clarify your previous statement, you're saying that you're not going to apply for any hardship waivers, uh, Highlands Act exemptions, nothing, no, no DEP or Highlands uh, waivers in the regulatory process. I specifically answer your questions that are related to the Clean Water Act, which does apply to our project. We have the permitting process will take place in its natural format. Whatever permitting is in place will be followed. I mean, if there's a, I don't know. The, I'm not the I'm not the attorney who does the permitting. I'm not the engineer who designs the project. I'm not involved in that aspect of it, so I really can't speak to what an exemption is or isn't. I do know we're required to comply with the Clean Water Act. That there is no exemption from that. Um, okay, so my next question would be, how many, you said that in Kinalon there's 23 parcels. How many parcels are there in this state? 607. 607. And how many have granted you survey permission? Uh, probably 85%. 85%. And what percentage of the project route is that? 
Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it can make a huge difference with the pennies pipeline. It's they have yeah. like seventy percent, and it's only thirty-seven percent of their route. So yeah, forty-seven percent of their forty percent of the pipeline in New Jersey, probably of the total pipeline, one third. Yes, yeah, okay, so it's about one third is in New Jersey, and of that one third, we have survey permission over eighty percent of them. Right, and so we keep hearing how pipelines are safer for transporting oil. However, the industry's own reports show that there's more pipeline leakage of oil than over different forms. That uh, between 1998 and 2007, the average annual spillage by pipelines was greater than that spilled from rail cars, tank ships, and tank barges combined. The report also found between that 1998 and 2007, that accounted for 39.14% of the average annual U.S. oil spillage across all sectors. That includes production, refining, transport, uh, storage, and consumption. So how, how can you claim that it's safer when more oil spills from a pipeline than from any other form of oil transportation? Yeah. Annually in this country, annually in this country, we ship 2.1 trillion barrels of oil by pipeline. Okay, 2.1 trillion barrels. By tanker car and rails, currently 246 million. So 10 times the amount of oil is shipped in pipelines versus tanker cars. But I don't want them to spill in the water. I have to. Right, and it does. It, we don't either, obviously. I mean, if I do that, I'm in, it's very bad business for me. No, we can't. Excuse me. Once again, I think that we're having, I think, a constructive meeting, and uh, if in fact we want to yell at uh, the official seer from Pipeline, I don't know what we're going to achieve, but we're attempting to do. So um, I don't like to control the time of speech. That's not what I'm about typically, but I want to just see a, a show of hands. How many other people would like to have the opportunity to speak tonight so I can kind of... Okay. Um, I'm going to ask, and I, I know that we've received a number of statements tonight, which is fine. But once again, we have an opportunity to ask the uh, officials from the company a question. And uh, so, once again, I'm going to ask that we um, basically confine our comments, speech to uh, questions to about a three minute uh, timeline and ask my uh, councilman, the councilwoman sitting here to kind of act as moderator, okay? Um, like I said, I think that uh, you guys have been great. And I want to say that outright. I, I'm always so proud of people that come to Kinawan and can actually enter, enter entertain and engage in a constructive dialogue. So this has been really informative for me and for our residents, and uh, if we can just continue the same decorum, I would appreciate it. So I'm going to turn back this mic to this young lady who has only three seconds left, so I want to see what she does with it. I, I just want to ask one last question. Who, who are your firm contracts with for this oil? Because uh, Phillips 66 spokesman Dennis Nuss said, at this time, we have no plans to make a shipping commitment on the proposed pipeline, nor are we involved in otherwise sponsoring this project. So where is this oil going? Phillips 66 is a purchaser of oil. They're not a shipper. We have shipping contracts. We're, we're a transportation company. We have contracts to ship oil on our pipeline if we're fortunate enough to get it permitted and get it built. But who's purchasing? Like, where is it going to? If there's no yeah. demand on this, there's no there's a supply side demand from Albany, but where is it going in New Jersey? There's the Inner Harbor connection. There's the uh, Kinder Morgan docks and the, and the refineries yeah. and the Buckeye blending uh, facilities. Blending facilities. There's multiple outpoints for crude oil in New Jersey. Thank you. Uh, I'm Ken Dalsky from Parsippany. Uh, a couple of people here said, let's talk about facts. So uh, let me produce a fact for you here. This is from an article in The Atlantic um, in April of this year. And uh, I think we've been talking around the issue about the relative spills between barges and pipelines. This measures barrel spills per billion ton miles. So it puts everything on an apples to apples basis. And it breaks it down over three different uh, annual, uh, three different yearly periods. In every single one of them, pipelines spill more per billion ton miles by a factor of two or three than barges. So this is, as far as I'm concerned, one of the most damning 
uh, pieces of evidence there is that there's no way barges can be seven times, uh, or pipelines can be seven times more uh, reliable than barges. Uh, second, uh, we've all heard about a lot of other spills, and PIMSA reports 228 uh, incidents every single year. Uh, we've heard about the Enbridge spill, where a million gallons of oil were spilled into the Kalamazoo River. Uh, we heard about the spill in Arkansas, in Mayflower, Arkansas, where five to 7,000 barrels from Exxon spilled out into the streets, and people had to be put out of their homes because of the fumes, so they can't even go back. And so all I, I heard all your statements about how, uh, how uh, safe this was going to be. Uh, if you had asked any of the executives from any of those pipeline companies five minutes before their pipelines ruptured, do you have any problems? Are there any risks? Is it safe? What do you think we would have heard? No problem here. This pa can't possibly happen. And then five minutes later, there were millions of gallons or thousands of gallons pouring out into the streets. So I hate to tell you, but you don't have any credibility when you tell us these things. Okay. The, the, the last thing that I want to bring up is pipelines are going to spill. And we asked about indemnification, and you said that uh, you're going to have insurance. If people are put out of their homes, are you going to pay for hotels? Exxon paid for months and months and months to put people up in hotels and then tried to renege in Arkansas. Um, how are you going to compensate them for having to tank water in if, the, if, the, if their uh, water supplies are, uh, are contaminated? Um, how are you going to add, you know, compensate them if they have to add costly purification systems in order to have water? There's a lot of harm, including health, health risks, just from the fumes alone. I mean, are you going to compensate for all of these things when, when your oil spills? No, my oil's not going to spill. <laughs> I just want to introduce myself first because this is the third time I'm talking. I happen to live only 41 years in Kinlong, and my property is affected, like I told you before. So I take a little from the lawyer that represents the unions for the heavy machinery. I'd like to invite him down to my house and show him about 60 hours of tapes when they built the highway and the vibration damage on my house and the noise. The other gentleman spoke that he had 35 years on the volunteer fire department, God bless him. I'm a retired deputy chief from Patterson and I only put in 38 years. And I don't think everything is safe on the gas lines or the oil lines and they're going to go against my record for 38 years to prove it differently to me. But that's their job. My job is to try and protect my family in that part of Kinlon. Three times I asked for the fire department. My neighbor's house burned in 82 on January 1st. 25 minutes. I'll give them credit because the roads were icy. Last six months ago, a garbage truck pulled up in front of my house on fire, asked to use my phone to call the department. I called them. 22 minutes to get from Boonton Avenue down to my house. We put the truck out with five gallon pails of water. So I know what my neighbors were talking about when they had the fire. And not against the police department. Since the highway came in and my part of the road is four lanes wide, I'm talking about Brook Valley. The speed limit's 25 on Brook Valley for anybody that doesn't know. <laughs> Yet when the people hit that bridge on the up curve coming down the hill, I clock some of them at 45.50. We don't have a big enough department to get people down there. They can make the salary. So I'd like to know where that gentleman with all that experience lives. <laughs> Is one of his properties that he loves the gas line? No, it's not horrible. It's not great either because we're not going to get any benefits. They're not going to fill my fuel tank with the oil. The gas line's not going to give me gas so I can have an emergency generator hooked up. So I'd like to know where the people that it's going to really affect are going to benefit. Thank you. Well, it's apparent I'm a terrible moderator. Three minutes is uh, a little longer in Kinelon than the rest of uh, New Jersey. Uh, so. 
We're going to try to hear to that, but I, I do have a question, if I could just interject something. I know that uh, we haven't discussed the timing on the pipeline, and ultimately between the time you secure, secure hypothetically, it does move forward, permits, and the construction uh, uh, project. What exactly are we looking for if, in fact, you were to proceed with approvals construction-wise? Yeah, we estimate the uh, permit approvals will take 12 to 14, possibly 16 months, and then a construction schedule will take about a year, depending on when we get our start, because there are lead time materials like pumps and steel that have to be ordered at a certain time, and so that'll just, it may be 12 months, it may be 18, it just depends on when we get our start. I'll take about 90 seconds. I just have something I'd like to read from the from the gas station owners, uh, without whom none of us could have been here this evening. This is from the New Jersey Gasoline Convenience Store and Automotive Association. For the past 48 years, this country has an embrace in all of the above energy policy for our country. By tapping American reserves of oil and natural gas, we've created tens of thousands of new jobs that have helped us all to emerge from the Great Recession. And now with this growing supply of oil and slower than expected demand, we're seeing gasoline prices finally decline at the pump. But supply is only one side of the energy security equation. The other side is distribution. America's bountiful newfound energy supplies are only as good as our ability to access them reliably and efficiently, and that requires infrastructure. Pipelines are by far the cheapest, most efficient, and safest mode of transporting oil and other, other energy resources to where they can be refined and brought to market. For New Jersey, the pipeline from Albany to Linden will add to our diversity of energy supply and will help our state and our citizens better withstand shocks to supply such as severe weather events or international crises. A new pipeline from Albany means a more reliable flow of oil, more locally available refined products, and greater economic activity for our local businesses and workers, all of which benefits our entire state. The NJGCA believes the Pilgrim Pipeline can be an important part of our state's economic engine and looks forward to learning more about this promising proposal. Thank you. Just a quick temperature check. Is it, is it warm in here? Yes. That I could take care of. The moderator, I'm not so sure about so. Good evening. My name is Jerome Wagner. I have a couple questions. Um, are there going to be two pipes or one pipe involved in this project? Two pipes. Two pipes. Uh, the size, 18 inches for the uh, southbound? 18 inches for the southbound crew, 16 inches for the northbound refine. Okay, thank you. Um, buried or above ground? Buried. Uh, blasting will be needed in many areas of construction. True or false? Yeah. In some areas, yes. Yeah. Do you know the operating temperatures, temp pressures rather, inside the pipes nominally? I do not. Do you know the flow rates, the typical flow rates? The, okay, not at this time. I'm not an engineer. Okay. Uh, what method of joining will be used for the pipe sections? How will they be assembled? Screws? They're welded. Welded, okay. Thank you very much. Can you answer how deep the trenches yeah, will typically be? Uh, below the frost line. <laughs> Three foot. I don't know what that is, but yeah, we better pull the frost line. Hello, my name is Kate Gibbs. I'm here to speak on behalf of the Engineers Labor Employer Cooperative. ELEC is a labor management trust that focuses on promoting economic development, investments in infrastructure, and construction projects to provide opportunities for the members of the operating engineers, Local 825, and the contractors who employ them. The Pilgrim Pipeline is a perfect example of the type of infrastructure investments that are so important. The benefits of such a project are numerous, including but not limited to the jobs created for our members and the contractors who will work on this project. But more importantly, ELEC strongly supports the proposed Pilgrim Pipeline because of its positive impact on the local economy and because it will improve the quality of life for New Jersey and its residents. This investment in New Jersey's energy infrastructure will have a positive impact on the local economy by creating local jobs and will have a larger impact on the regional economy. Infrastructure investments like this one are a tool for economic development. Businesses are more likely to locate or expand in the state if they have access to reliable and affordable energy. 
This country and New Jersey in particular are in desperate need of energy infrastructure. Located in the northeast region of the U.S., we are responsible for vast amounts of oil consumption. However, we have no direct pipeline to serve our residents and businesses. Instead, oil must be carried by barge and then shipped. Not only is this process incredibly inefficient in economic terms, it is also harmful to the environment and subject to extreme weather conditions. In light of the devastating effects of storms in recent years, like Hurricane Irene and Superstorm Sandy, it seems foolish not to invest in a modern, stable, and reliable means of petroleum transportation. Hi, uh, my name is Anita Shotwell. I'm a trustee of Wildlife Preserves, which owns the majority of Troy Meadows uh, in Persephone and East Hanover, through which Pilgrim Pipeline proposes to put more than a mile of their pipeline uh, route. Now, aside from the issues of the environmental impact, which other people have already discussed, um, and that is considerable in a critical wetland area, I have to take issue with uh, property rights uh, because I know we have not, uh, for one, given permission to survey for at least one mile of your route, despite the, uh, the others that have already given permission. And I want to know, uh, my first question, where does Pilgrim Pipeline's property rights, rights to my property begin um, for this property that's been protected as a sanctuary for 60 years? Uh, question number two is, uh, and I, I appreciate the concerns about jobs and things, and the union guys, I'm sure, would do the best job possible if they're going to build something that's not going to leak. However, if and when that does rupture in that one mile plus stretch of desolate wetlands, how fast do you propose someone is going to be there to address that uh, spill? And what mechanism do you propose to do so to absorb that oil that's going into that uh, vital recharge area? As it relates to uh, the spill response, PIMSA, the federal regulatory agency, requires we retain a firm that has within a 24 hour response to the notification of a spill. I'm sorry, 24 hour? <laughs> a 24 hour? Do you mean around the clock? How long will it take for them to get out there? 24 hour around the clock. It happens at midnight tonight. They'll be there before midnight tomorrow. And within 24 hours, do you know how far that whale is going to travel? It's it's in the middle of uh, well, the line. The line is shut down immediately. So. <laughs> About the, you asked about the cleanup. We didn't talk about. I mean, that's the response team. Okay, so within a day, and then uh, as far as well, the shutdown is immediate. So mm -hmm. That happens immediately. All right, and then what's already spilled it since the time that you detected? I'm assuming you have state of the art detection and all that. But who's going to be out there? But within a day, that's your answer. And the other question about uh, where does your do your rights, property rights? Uh, where do you see your property, your rights to our protected property begin and end? I guess I don't understand that question, but... What you... it, so as long as we continue to say no, we don't want you putting your pipeline through that, that area, we don't want you to come in and survey, that will be acceptable. We're not going to have to use more of our nonprofit resources to take this to court. Well, I mean, if the design of the project you know, winds up being across your property and we can't come to a, a reasonable agreement. As a pipeline company, under New Jersey statutes, we do have the right to have domain. Okay. Okay. Hi, I, I do not live in Kinlon, but I do live, I want to show you on the map, actually closer to the pipeline than where we're standing right now, in Wayne. I live right here in Wayne, right on the river. It's in my backyard. And I have a few questions for you. I just, just anecdotally, I want to let everyone know that when Irene hit and the river rose 26 feet into my yard and surrounded my house, my neighbor's oil tank busted, and I got a little taste of what it would be like to smell benzene 24 hours a day for a week. And my children were sick, and I was sick, and the animals in the neighborhood were sick. Everyone was sick, and that was just one woman's oil tank that exploded in the flood water. 
moving flood water that lingered for six weeks after we scrubbed our entire neighborhood down with dawn. So just to give you a little taste of what that's going to be like, a very, very small fraction. I'd like to know from your project, when has there ever been a project of this scope and magnitude in an area that's this densely populated? And how did it affect the people in that area? Do you, are you, do you even realize that New Jersey is more densely populated? You're from New Jersey. You should know how densely populated it is here. There is nowhere in New Jersey that is less densely populated than anywhere in India or China. More than 1,200 people per square mile, even in the areas that are sparsely populated. There's a lot of people that could be affected by an oil spill and a lot of wildlife and a lot of environmental damage. We already are the butt of jokes for the entire country for environmental damage in this, and I don't want to continue that legacy into the future for my children. I have a one-year-old and a four-year-old. So you're telling me by the time my son is in kindergarten, there's going to be a pipeline running a few miles from our house? There most likely already is. There's 35,000 miles of pipelines that run through New Jersey. Of crude oil? No, they're not all crude. Some are gasoline, some are petrol, some are So when's the last time a project of this scope was done in this state? I would say the Kinder Morgan line, the Tennessee gas line, the Spectre Energy line, that everybody talks about. Yeah, it, 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 does it run through the entire state of New Jersey? Yes. Yeah. And how many leaks have they? It actually crosses the Hudson River and goes into Manhattan. How many gallons of oil have they leaked so far? It, it's a gas line, but... And it's leaking right now. <laughs> Just do it like you want to see what they've shown. Show them some of what Last person. I, I cut you off before. Hop on the back of the line, please. And uh, thank you. Hi, my name is Chris. Um, I try to hang on the back of the line because I'm not from New Jersey. Um, I'm from Newburgh, New York, which is in Orange County, um, right on the Hudson River. Um, right where 80, Route 84, or Interstate 84, crosses the Hudson. Um, and I came to this meeting because, like the woman from Sierra Club mentioned, um, this is the first opportunity to talk to you guys in person and ask some questions. Um, so I'm with an organization uh, called CODE, which stands for Citizens Opposed During Energy. And one of, um, they, on, their, on your website, the, the, the map of the pipeline, there's a little offshoot that goes out to the river um, right on the border of Newburgh and to Windsor, um, right where Global Oil is. Um, one, of the, one of the things our organization is doing is bringing attention not only to the pipeline issue, but the issue with Global Oil. Uh, they're involved in litigation right now um, in Albany, and which involves the Newburgh New Windsor terminal a little bit, um, but currently they, well, a, a couple of weeks ago, they withdrew the application there, and now they're resubmitting it. So I, I my question um, is, what's going to go on in that little offshoot, and what does Global Oil have to do with it? And if you're saying that this is to reduce barge traffic on the Hudson River, and to reduce train traffic of this back in oil, why is it going there? I mean, I, I, I'm here, and my shirt's red under here. I'm in solidarity with everybody fighting the pipeline from its entire length. But there's all this talk about all the way to Linden, and obviously, just right, like right here, all the communities that could potentially go through. Why are you going to Newport? Why are you going out to the Hudson there? And what is your relationship with Global Oil? And have you filed pre-application or applications with the New York DEC? We have not started the New York secret process yet. We have that calendar for December. Uh, the Newburgh lateral uh, is to service the uh, fuel depot that's currently in, I think it's New Windsor, actually. Uh, it, yeah, that much, yeah, that's uh, refined products receiving. So the refined products line will deliver to there. So why are there going to be two lines up either Can side of the state creek? It, it's, it's proposed for, the, like you said, the the north line and the south line, right? One's the back and coming down. Yeah, but the line that goes over is only refined. 
Yeah, the, the line that goes to the terminals is refined. The Bakken group is coming. Uh, it's loaded up in Albany and Rensselaer. Uh -huh. So there's there's no there's there's one line for product coming off of I guess barges or trains that are going north from the Newburgh. No, no, no. The, uh, we're, we're proposing by building this project that will no longer be the delivery of refined products on the Hudson River by barge. So in order to get the refined products to the terminal stations, the lateral has to come off our main line and go over to the coast where the tankage facilities are. At Global Oil? Global is a supplier, yeah. Is that, the bon is that where they're applying for the modification for tanks for the packing? Well, I have no idea what Global's business plans are. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hello, my name is Pamela Meredith. I'm a Kinalong resident. Um, I want to start off just by saying thank you to all the neighboring towns that came out to support stopping the pipeline and to Sierra Club for making this special effort to join us. Um, thanks for coming. Um, I just want to say, first of all, for a second of all, um, when you say eminent domain and you chuckle, I find it really offensive. Um, <laughs> there's really nothing funny about this at all. Nothing. And I just sort of sat at the back and observed these little smirks and chuckles, and it's ridiculous, and I can't stand it. So I had to get up and just let you know that that's no way to conduct yourself in these kinds of meetings. Um, <laughs> thirdly, I just want to say that um, there, there's just so much evidence that this is toxic. And 500,000 people Sorry. marched in New York last month mm -hmm. to stop climate change. And if this town and this country doesn't start thinking about stopping climate change, then we're all in trouble. We won't have clean drinking water or anything. So if we want to create jobs, People talking about jobs. Let's get solar jobs going. Let's get yeah. solar yeah. in yeah. Okay. And Let's get our government to let Tesla in so we can have electric cars to drive. Let's change the thinking in this town, in this country. Um, and finally, I just want to ask if this pipeline is um, has relationship to the infrastructure for high volume fracking. No. Hello, uh, my name is Avery Hart. I also live in Kinalan, and thank you for coming. Um, what I did not appreciate in your PowerPoint is all those pretty green pictures <laughs> and the greenwashing aspect of it. I really found that offensive. Okay, and I think you're just in the wrong town. <laughs> Maybe you don't realize it, but Kinalan is as close to pristine as New Jersey gets. And the people will not welcome your pipeline. And we will fight your pipeline hard. And we will all get together and make sure it doesn't happen. So if you come to Kenilon again, <laughs> Call me up. We've got beautiful lakes here. We've got beautiful mountains, and we have wonderful wildlife and trees. We don't want 53,000 trees coming down in Kenilon. Hi, uh, my name is Sally Gellert. I am here speaking on behalf of the Unitarian Universalist Legislative Ministry of New Jersey. When a member brought this issue to us, I did a bit of simple research and discovered these two statements on the Pilgrim Pipeline Holding LLC website. Delivering refined petroleum products to existing terminals in New York at a more than competitive rate. Allowing additional standby transportation capacity to be available to handle any increased demand surges. These statements do not reassure, reassure as presumably intended, but instead bring to mind a number of questions. Delivering to terminals in New York, how much more than currently delivered oil would be brought to the densely populated communities of the New York metropolitan area? We understand that the terminus is Linden, New Jersey, a densely populated environmental justice community 
that not long ago successfully fought off a large carbon capture and sequestration energy plant. Is the consequence of their success to be increased processing of shale oil with the inevitable negative health effects and degraded air quality? I forget that it's back in oil. Additional standby transportation capacity. For what contents? Okay, you say it's not a cover for bringing frack gas into the region. Uh, so I will ignore those comments because we all know how dangerous and, and uh, polluting fracking is with the burning tap water and the escaped methane. Questions that do not come directly from the Pilgrim Pipeline Holdings website. Why bring this material to Linden so close to Port Newark, Port Elizabeth? Is the elephant in the room the planned exportation of our resources? And if so, for whose profit and at what cost to whom? People might be willing to give up land for local energy use. Certainly most would be much less willing to do so for export, for expanding the profits of a multinational corporation that might or might not have a presence in the community, many of which corporations have records of exploiting and abandoning areas, and many of which have bad safety records. In fact, the permit applications are Pilgrim Pipelines Holdings LLC. Will that entity exist after the pipe is constructed, or will it be sold to an unknown party? Has Pilgrim Pipeline Holdings been around long enough to establish its own safety record? If the pipeline is to be operated by another company, what is the safety record of that entity? For instance, as Enbridge and Trans Canada apply for more pipelines, their safety record has been examined, and it is not good. One Trans Canada pipeline had 12 accidents in the first year alone, as cited by Think Progress. What will be the effect on our communities and wilderness areas of any spills or other accidents? Certainly we should know what entity will be responsible when the inevitable happens. And it is inevitable, even with the most care. Humans are not infallible. Materials deteriorate with age. The final point to be made is the so-called opportunity cost of this pipeline. Many of our members attended a climate march last weekend, last weekend, whatever, asking for a strong climate free. Actions, not words. This was written right after that, that march when this meeting was first scheduled. Uh, could the cost of this pipeline be deployed into renewable, sustainable energy sources instead of further investing in the 19th century technologies of fossil fuels? Every dollar spent on this pipeline is a dollar not spent on solar, wind, tide, even geothermal. We can, we must do better. Thank you. Yeah. My name is Margaret Wood. I'm from West Milford, New Jersey, but I'm here today speaking as a member of the board for the Lakeland Unitarian Universalist Fellowship in Wayne, New Jersey. We are the closest UU church to this town, and so we are obligated to serve it. And I want you to know that the members of the board of the Lakeland Unitarian Universalist Fellowship voted unanimously to oppose this pipeline. My colleague who just spoke represents the UU Legislative Ministry, which attempts to make change through the legislative branch of New Jersey's government. So now you have it that on both a local level and a state level, the UUs oppose this pipeline. And now I would like to speak on a personal level for myself. Um, how far apart are the shut up valves on your pipeline? I tried to answer that earlier. It's an engineering question that depends on the layout of the pipeline itself. Uh, in some areas, they're very close, and in some areas, they're further apart. Well, I'm an engineer, and I attended a lecture before I came here so I could have some knowledge of it, which perhaps you should have done. And they said that the shutoff valves are 10 miles apart. And considering the capacity of these pipelines, you can spill 200,000 barrels of oil between those shutoff valves. First, first of all, ma'am, it's a requirement that be no more than 10 miles apart. That's the fact. Not that they are 10 miles apart. They can be no more than 10 miles apart. And in your and in our 176 mile pipeline, it holds 200,000 barrels in total. And as an engineer, I can tell you that they design for the least cost. And if they're allowed to be 10 miles apart, they will be 10 miles apart. <laughs> My name is Ted Glick. I'm uh, here rep with the group from Roseland against the compressor station. I also work with the Green Party. I just noticed that, um, seeing on the map here, this goes right next to or in Roseland, uh, in between Roseland and East Hanover. So I hope you all come to Roseland and East Hanover and have one of these public meetings there so people can do the same kind of thing in terms of raising our concerns. 
Um, I got up to speak about the issue of jobs. You know, er, the, I, I was glad to hear um, the woman, a few speakers earlier, talk about that issue. Uh, there were several speakers towards the beginning who spoke as if this is an issue of, on the one hand, people who want jobs and economic development, and on the other hand, kind of tree huggers and environmentalists. And that's not true. If you're, if you're serious about jobs, then you should be about renewable energy and energy efficiency um, and the, the energy sources that are not just good for the planet, but that are good for jobs and good for economic development. Because you look at the statistics, I mean, look at this pipeline. Are yeah, there going to be construction jobs if this is built? How many permanent jobs will there be after it's built? Very, very few. Uh, 40. 40 permanent jobs. It's like the Roseland compressor station. Um, there are some construction jobs to build it. Now there's two permanent jobs at that Roseland compressor station. Fossil fuel energy development is not a jobs creator in the same way and to the same extent that job creation is when, it, when, you, when, it, when you are serious about renewables, energy from the wind, from the sun, um, as well as energy efficiency to conserve energy. That's where we should be going. And ju just for, I'm not sure how many members of uh, Leona or um, other pipeline, uh, potential pipeline workers are here, you know, there, there could be some really good work done um, to replace a lot of the uh, 50, 60, 70 year old pipelines that are leaking a lot of methane. Um, in, in, in cities and in towns, right? Um, it seems to me I would love to see the union leadership um, that builds pipelines give, the, give leadership um, that that's where um, construction of pipelines should go. We're not going to get off fossil fuels right away. It's going to take some time. In the meantime, let's plug all those leaks that are leaking methane up and, and, and increasing the temperature of the earth. Hi, my name is Matt Smith. I'm an organizer with Food and Water Watch and a resident of Wanakew, New Jersey, um, which would also be impacted by your pipeline. I have a, uh, several questions that I want to ask first, if you could track those questions, because I do want to make a quick statement at the end. Uh, my questions are, where will the 4% of new right-of-way be located? In which municipalities specifically? Uh, what are the planned setbacks from the existing uh, pressurized gas lines that are required or that you will use for your oil pipeline? Uh, what's the impact radius, or as the industry calls it, kill zone, if an incident or explosion is to occur? What are the permits needed, and what agencies will be involved in, in the permitting process? And how will the township maintain oversight and decision making um, throughout the remediation process? You mentioned you'll have corporations like Halliburton coming in. Um, how does the town have a local say in the decision making around remediation? Oh, and one more. Will you go before BPU for utility designation? Um, and for my quick statement, I just want to echo, uh, you know, the, the speaker before me in saying that I think uh, for too long we've been separate, but separated by these arguments of jobs versus the environment. No one can deny that we're stuck on fossil fuels today, but we owe it to our children and our grandchildren to. Uh, make immediate uh, transition uh, now off of fossil fuels and start the, building the renewable energy systems of the future. Uh, the gentleman, George, claims that this pipeline has no relation to hydraulic fracturing. Uh, fact, 100% of the oil that will be that is produced from the Bakken shale is extracted via hydraulic fracturing. This despoils trillions of gallons of non-renewable clean water sources for our country. It pollutes the climate, it pollutes the land, it's destroying communities throughout the country. Um, to deny that this pipeline has no connection to fracking um, is, a cr is a crime against the communities who are experiencing that. Um, I also want to mention this, this myth of energy independence. Right now, the oil and gas industry is going through an extreme extraction boom throughout our continent. Um, they're telling us that the oil is about energy independence. Simultaneously, they're targeting up to 50% of oil and gas consumption in the U.S. for offshore export. There are 19 new billion dollar facilities to take the oil and gas that's being extracted today from fracking um, and ship it overseas to developing countries like China and Europe. So how is this about energy independence? If we're serious about energy independence, we will unite as my uh, friend and colleague Ted suggested, we will demand better from this corporate system that pushes pollution 
and toxicity in our communities, and we will demand real, lasting, sustainable, high-paying jobs, uh, getting to work competing with the rest of the world who's already getting to work on building renewable energy systems. Um, and I think that's it. Thank you. I know that uh, Pipeline has a, uh, a website, uh, pilgrimpipeline.com, but it's going to ask a question. I understand that. Um, do you have an interactive uh, um, way of people asking questions and having online conversations with them to address some of the issues that were brought up? Yeah, they, we have an email address on the website. They can email those questions in and we can respond to them. Uh, last speaker asked some questions, so if you can just, if you want to take a moment to address some of them, or none of them, or somewhere in between. Yeah, the four percent that's not on existing right of ways; those are just transitional parcels. They happen throughout the route. I don't have a specific location for each of them, but it's uh, when you jump from, uh, you know, one one right of way to another. There's a corridor you must cross. So. You know, and then also the laterals uh, that the gentleman from New York mentioned uh, that come into the towns, those are also uh, on, uh, some of those are located on non-utility right-of-ways in New York. Oh, for the gas line question, uh, PIMSA requires a 25-foot setback from any pressurized gas line. Yeah. No, locationally 25 percent. The blasting obviously has to be a safety factor, and you know they'll the engineers will determine that. It has to be 25 feet. That's the pipeline. I don't think that's accurate. They're going to put power lines two feet from the. Well, it's about 25. Well, 25 is what the a requires you to be a distance between a gas line and another line. That's a requirement. I mean, not, not for utilities, but for other pipelines it is. As far as the list of permits that we need, I, I, I don't have that list available. I mean, there's New Jersey DEP. We've gone through the pre-app process, and they're in the process of generating all the uh, agency contacts that we'll require. Would you be willing to post the pre-certification letter they gave you? That the DEP provided you with all the Just, please, this is not the format. I understand that. You may have some questions, but in fact, I'm actually going to close it right now. I want to thank our representatives from uh, Pilgrim for showing up. I want to say thank you on behalf of Kinelon. We're an exceptional community. Uh, you guys were great tonight, and uh, I can't thank you enough for coming out and hopefully uh, have the opportunity to express yourself. Thank you so much, and have a, have a safe trip home. Thank you.